بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. And this really signifies and, and, and I think it highlights the life of many people today. Many of us here are professionals. We work in corporate Canada. We are trying to balance our life between our commitments to the company that we work for or the organization that we work for and our personal life. Personal meaning our family life, our life with, for example, our spouse, our children, entertainment, uh, permissible pleasures. And that balance becomes very difficult for many people. Just a few months ago, I was speaking to a young man from our community, a professional going into, uh, you know, into the corporate space. And he says to me, he says, brother, he goes, I have a, I have a problem in my life. I have this dichotomy I'm come up, I've come up with. Do I go into religion wholeheartedly, fully 100%, 110% dive into Islam and forget about my career and my, you know, my student loans and all that effort I've done? Or do I leave the religion of Islam to be a weekend thing and dive into my professional career 24-7? He couldn't choose where to make that balance. And I had to say to him, you know what, you have to do both. Again, you can't forget one over the other. You lead, you lead a life in this part of the world or anywhere that we live, and you have to balance life and work. This is one of the biggest things even where I work at. When we have sessions and our OD partners come and our managers speak to us, they say that, yes, we know you have overtime. A project will come up and you'll have to put in overtime on the weekends and evenings. But our managers stress on a work-life balance, that you have to keep time for yourself. You have to have time for your own personal development, for your growth. And we know that if that doesn't happen, people end up burning out. You have people that, and you read these stories, people that work 60, 70, 80 hour weeks, and they just can't take it anymore. Their life is in shambles. Their spouse is doing whatever they want to do. Their children are running around just crazy because they haven't maintained their family, because they've gotten so attached to work that they haven't balanced their life. So people ask me sometimes, how do you balance working in a company where you are so pressured? And how do you balance that with your life outside? Religious obligations, family commitments, all of these different things. And I want to share a secret with us. Well, it won't be a secret after I give it to you. But for those who aren't here, it's going to be a secret. So don't tell them about the hadith. Let them struggle on their own to find it. But this hadith, which comes from our seventh Imam, Imam Al-Qadim alayhi salam, he gives us the secret of how to actually have that work-life balance. You know, you don't need to go to Stephen Covey and all of these so-called experts that write books and they, you know, suck money out of our community. We buy their self-help manual and we go to their seminars and we'll spend three or four thousand dollars to learn how to balance your life. The Imams gave us this for free. They said, don't give us any money in return. Don't give us anything, just love the family have love for the family of the Prophet and take the teachings, imbibe them, reflect on them and put them into practice. And this hadith will show us that there is a way to have a work-life balance and still maintain our religiosity. So the seventh Imam is reported to have said, try to divide your time into four portions. Now, don't think that you have to download the app on your smartphone and now divide your time, six hours, six hours. No, don't put them into segments of, of six hours each, let's say. But make sure you have time in the day for each of these four, or time in the week for each of these four things the Imam is gonna show us. And again, with, with technology, it's so easy today. You have your tablets and your phones. We can program our lives around a lot of these things. So the Imam begins by saying, one portion should be dedicated to conversing with God. We have to be people who are in a connection to our Creator. Connection not just in the obligations, there are five times daily prayers, month of Ramadan comes, we fast, maybe we go for Hajj, maybe we do this, maybe we give in charity. No, the connection to Allah always has to be strong. You know, one of the first things that we said when we came into the center, we asked the brothers, do you have a Wi-Fi connection? 
Why? Because we need to be connected all the time. Not just when I'm at home, not just at my desk. I want to have 24-7 connectivity to the internet. Why don't I try to have 24-7 connectivity to Allah? I am worried about my Wi-Fi connection. Can I check my Facebook status? Can I tweet? Can I go on WhatsApp or Instagram? But I don't think about, can I connect to Allah wherever I am? So we need to spend a time, and again, not six hours, not an hour, not two hours. It'll be different for each and every one of us in this room. Each of us will find a different way to connect to Allah. But as the Imam says, one portion of your day needs to be spent connecting to Allah. And it's not difficult, you know, again, I come from the corporate world and people say, you can't pray at work. I say, why can't you pray at work? I pray Jamaat prayers at work. I've had iftar with my Muslim brothers at work. So if I can do that, then anybody can do that. It's not that we live in a police state or a state of rule by anarchy or, you know, a irreligious country that we are um, not allowed to practice Islam. No, we have ability to pray at, at, at work. If we don't have rooms, I have seen people who have worked in professional institutions and their director has given them their personal office to pray. So if they don't have a spirituality room, you can go to a manager or a director and they will give you time. And you don't have to ask for time. You have your lunch break. You take your lunch break at the time of prayers. If you work a night shift, you take your coffee break or dinner at the time of Maghrib, you accommodate your prayer schedule to fit with the way that you're working. And you make sure that you pray on time. Again, there should be no exception or no excuse to not pray on time. Unless you're a heart surgeon and you're involved in a heart surgery, all of us have five minutes to take to make our dhuhr or asr or maghrib or isha. It doesn't become a burden on us and it, it, it isn't a burden on us. The second thing our Imam says, one portion of your day should be to seek legitimate earnings. This again is important. We can't forget this world. We're here. We're here in Canada or in America, wherever we come from. This is our home. And we have commitments. We have commitment to our family. We have commitment to our religious communities to fund them, to support them. We have a commitment to the orphans around the world, the widows, people who are suffering. And the only way we can take care of these responsibilities is through legitimate earnings. So we have to make sure that we have a legitimate source of income, that we're earning positive money, that we're paying our responsibilities to Allah and the Prophet. And then we obviously take care of everything else that comes after that. The third thing the Imam says, he says one part of your day should be for interaction with your religious brothers and sisters and your trustworthy friends. But not just anybody. You know, we unfortunately, we don't think twice about who our friends are. Our children go to school and they find people who are of the same age and they don't have the best morals, unfortunately. They may not follow our religion and they become their friend and their confidant and they go over their home for lunch and dinner. Those kids come to your homes. But the Imam says, don't only have interaction with your brothers and sisters and trustworthy friends, but he says, people who show you your defects and treat you sincerely. If I have a brother in faith who is a good friend of mine, I should be able to tell him or he should be able to tell me. And for the sisters, your sister in faith should be able to tell you, you know what, you're doing this wrong. It'd be better if you did it like this. You know what, brother, I saw you doing this. It's not the right way to do things. Why don't we change it up a bit and do things the right way? So those who can point out my own defects, they should actually be the people I'm looking to interact with. Amir al-Mu'mineen has said in a hadith that the most beloved of friends to me is the one who points out my defects to me. So I shouldn't be upset if somebody says, you know, this is not correct or you did this not right. I should welcome that as positive criticism that he's trying to make me a better person. Because when I look in the mirror, I just see beauty. I don't see my defects. When I pray my salat, I don't know I'm doing this or that wrong because I don't see myself praying. But the person sitting beside me, he'll see me praying and he'll notice I did something wrong. So I should look for people like that. And that's why the Imam says one portion should be to have those religious brothers and sisters 
who are trustworthy, who will tell you when you're slipping, and that they treat you with sincerity. They actually care for you. They're not doing it out of any ulterior motive or greed or envy. No, they care that they want you to get to paradise and they want to get to paradise and be with you. And when you have a brother or sister like that that cares that you want to get to Jannah, it makes the whole difference in the world. Rather than having friends who want you to go out partying and getting drunk and, and, and on drugs, those people we don't want to be with. We don't want to hang out with them. Right? So we need to look for friends, as the Imam says, and, and be with them. And again, take time to be with them. Make time out of your schedule to have friends who can actually help you progress towards Allah. Then the Imam says, your fourth portion should be to partake, or rather your third portion should be to partake in your legitimate pleasures. So we have brothers and sisters who are, I'm sure, into sports. It's a legitimate pleasure. Enjoy it. Brothers like to play basketball. Sisters want to play you know, volleyball or tennis or basketball. As long as you observe the limits of the the genders and your clothing is appropriate, enjoy these pleasures. If people want to play video games, as long as you're not playing those violent, destructive games where there's profanity and, and explicit scenes, if it's a legitimate pleasure, enjoy it. This is a way that we can, you know, also enjoy our life at the same time that we, it'll help us out in other ways and we'll see this in the hadith. So we have to, as the Imam says, enjoy the permissible pleasures within our religion. Sometimes youth say to me, and when I was growing up, I thought that, you know what, Islam is a boring religion. We pray, we got to fast, we got to do all of these things, but there's never fun in the religion. We come to the mosque and it's always strict, strict, got to pray on time. You go to the Sunday school and the teachers are just, you know, like monsters. There's never happiness in Islam. We need to change that up, make Islam fun. It has to be a fun religion. Yeah, there's seriousness when prayer time comes. We're serious about prayers. When you have the money for Hajj, it's serious business. But there has to be enjoyment in our religion. The Prophet, I, I didn't bring the hadith here, but there's a hadith from the Prophet where he says, enjoy yourself, have fun, and don't become very strict or very stern. Right? Don't be a very like a, a stern, you know, angry person all the time. You know, some Muslims out there, you go to their mosque and they're just they, they look at you and they're grim, they're they're grumbling, they're mad, they're not they're not happy. Right? They have a bad version of Islam that they're following. It's not what the Prophet taught us. The Prophet played. Right? We have a hadith where the grandsons of the Prophet would climb on his back and they would play with the Prophet. So we have to ensure that we have Again, in, in, its, in its own time and space, we have that fun within our religion. The Imam then says an interesting thing. He says, through that last part, you'll, better, you'll be better able to manage the other three parts of your life. So, again, the Imam talked about working, about your munajat, your prayers to Allah, earning your living and enjoyment. And the Imam says that through that last one, you'll be able to manage everything else. Right? If you lead a life of no pleasure, you know, just all work, 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 no time to relax, no time to just kick back and, and, and enjoy and just sit back and, you know, and, and look at the bigger picture, you're going to be a very difficult person to maintain, to live. You're going to have a bad impression of Allah. You're going to be very tired and, and stressed and aggravated all the time. And so we need to make sure that we have this change within our life, that we are taking care of our religious responsibilities first and foremost, but that we have all of that other time to devote to our friends, to devote to Allah, to devote to ourselves and to our own income so we can again be productive members of this society that we're in.